It is six o'clock and it is the first Thursday of the month. And that means it is time once again for the post prison education program radio show. And we're joined here live in the KODX studios once again by Ari Cohn. He is the founder and president of the post prison education program. Ari, thanks uh, again for coming in. Thanks. It's good to be here, Mike. So uh, we are in uh, month. I, I, I'm losing track of how many months we've been doing the, the pandemic, but uh, at least four. April, May, June, July. A Five long months. time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and it's reduced the number of guests we can bring in. Although last time you had... Uh, Jen Holland came in, and, but I can't get anybody on my staff to come in that, I co- that my co-workers... And I've really been wanting Hannah Myrick and uh, and Taylor Buck to come in and talk to everybody. And now we've got uh, Layla Khan. Khan, we finally got her in from India. It's like, you know, she um, she works in our applicant and student services group, and she's but she's been working full time thanks to WebEx from New Delhi. Oh wow! And 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 had we've been trying for two months to get her back to the states in co- because of COVID nineteen, haven't been able to. And finally, she got an Air France flight, sixteen hundred and twenty five dollars. We put it on Governor Inslee's J C Penney's card, but it declined. So, <laughs> so we ended up having to pay for it. It's like somebody needs to tell Inslee to pay his bills. But, yeah. But anyway, so so last Friday night. I went down to SeaTac and picked Layla up, and um, and she, she was like thirty hours on Air France from New Delhi through Paris, and then and then into L.A. and then from L.A. up to here. But so we, it would be a really cool show if we could get like me not here, have Hannah and Taylor and Layla. And I could sit at home in my recliner and listen to them <laughs> because they're they're all super amazing. And uh, it's kind of been a, a fantasy of yours, though, since we started this show, is that you'd eventually be able to just sit back somewhere else on on a beach somewhere. And well, I did it show. once, you know, when 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 I think when Don Wilchius and uh, Joe Jensen were here on, I got to stay home and listen, um, and. Maybe one other time, but I know I know when Don and and Joe were on, I was able to stay home and listen. But it's it's just people are people who are smart are scared, and then and then they're the the can I say dumbass? Then they're the then they're the dumbasses. <laughs> you know, it's just like so. Anyway, we're and I can't the way the news is. You can't I can't even predict that next month. Right. It will be any, everybody will feel safe. In our office, it's really um, like today, Caitlin Lombardi, who's our director, development director, and Taylor and I were in the office. And we're like, you know, one person in the kitchen at a time, and, and we're maintaining every bit of 14 foot, 14 to 25 foot social distancing and and super cautious the air conditioner running the windows open and keeping the circulation going and um the other day hannah and taylor and i were in and then someday like hannah and taylor will be in but we're being really we're being really cautious we've got one conference table that has like a thousand dollars worth of purell this and purell that on it and whole bucket of little Purell bottles and uh, so we're you know we're being and we're close to the public you know we talk to we we talk to people on WebEx mm-hmm. you know it's, so whether it's a prisoner or a current student or, or whatever and I'm really pleased I, um, with how this has turned out it's uh We've got one guy who's finishing 26 years, and um, and he's a Bishop Lewis work release, and 
and and we worked with the supervisor of that work release to put in a Chromebook and a Verizon jetpack. So like Taylor and Layla and everybody can work with him um, and, and talk face to face. He just goes up and checks out the Chromebook for the front desk of, of Bishop Lewis work release and, he, and then he goes into a common area, um, uses our Verizon jetpack and, and we can talk to him just like we're in the same room. And we're doing that with people that are in prison and in the prisons where movement's allowed, we're doing that. And if, if, if I was going to talk about what's most distressing, it, it would be um, what's, you know, what's going on with COVID-19 in the prisons. It's, uh, Taylor and I were talking about it today. So the, the DOC's got a, uh, uh, a link on their website and, and that, that shows confirmed cases, right? So you just go doc.wa.gov and then you click on this, the big link at the, right at the top of their homepage and then you can click on the next page, you click on confirmed cases and you can look at each prison and each work release and see how many deaths, how many confirmed cases, how many prisons don't have anything, and um, and it's been really interesting and sad to watch, like the Washington State Penitentiary, um, for the longest time it seemed like didn't have any cases, and then they had a few, like four or five, and then once you have that, it just explodes. So I think it was 51 when I looked at it this afternoon. So, so once somebody takes it into the prison, um, any of the prisons, then it just explodes. So like at the women's prison uh, it, it, outside of Gig Harbor, they've been wonderfully n with no cases, right? And, um, now, and now, and then all of a sudden now they've got a couple cases. And so now if it, if it follows like Coyote Ridge Correction Center, which has almost 250 cases plus two deaths, it'll explode. Um, and so we're, um, where we're working with s students and applicants, you know, Monroe is a big concern of mine. We've got a lot of people we're working with at Monroe and those five prisons up there. And, and it's just got, well, we're just like hoping and praying we can get these people that we're working with out of there safely. I mean, we're, um, and, you, and you have no control over it. And it's just, uh, I was thinking earlier today that it's, it's it, you know, it's, some people can break the law and, it, and they get treated like they didn't break the law, right? And, and, and so people in Inslee and DOC's crowd you know, they're employing people that live very irresponsibly in their communities, resulting to which they take COVID-19 into the prisons, and the prisoners are just sitting ducks. They can't, they, they're sitting ducks. It reminds me of the Vietnam War and what used to be called kill box. You know, prisoners are in a kill box, and, um, and so they're not, they don't, they don't, they're not, they're not like getting a pass from the, superintendent of a prison to go downtown to the local 7-Eleven, a restaurant, contracting COVID-19 and bring it into the prison. It's the, it's the employees of the Department of Corrections that are bringing it in because they're living irresponsibly. And, and, and then everybody, including other DOC employees and prisoners, and, and pay, the pap, pay the price. And it's, it's horrible. And um, I don't know. It's... Uh, and I think it's just going to ex explode. It's, it is exploding. You can watch this DOC page, and it seems to be exploding. I mean, the way, the way Con L, Coyote Ridge Correction Center, exploded was just unbelievable to the point they have the National Guard down there a few weeks ago overseeing testing, you know. Um, but I think it's 233 
men in that prison. It's the largest prison in the state of Washington and two deaths now. And that's where DOC employees live irresponsibly. And there's no doubt that's, that's, that's all there is to it. They live irresponsibly. Maybe they don't social distance. Maybe they don't wear a goddamn mask. I, can I say that? And um, maybe they don't wash their hands. Maybe all of that. Maybe half of it. Uh, but they do something that's does probably not in accordance with CDC, probably doesn't not in accordance with World Health Organization recommendations. They contract COVID-19 and they take it into the prisons. And the prisoners are just F-U-C-K-E-D. I didn't say it. I just spelled it. See? Is that, that okay? Yeah, okay. So I think that's okay with yeah, the FCC. So I guess we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, well, and I can't imagine that the the uh, the availability of testing in our prisons is any better than it is on the outside of prisons. And we know that its testing is completely inadequate for those of us uh, here in the Seattle area. I, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, the, but I think I think the difference is out here. I think people. Maybe government doesn't want testing, but I think people want testing and want to be tested. And so like Layla is, we knew before we got her back from New Delhi that she was going to quarantine for 14 days. So we've got her in an Airbnb downtown. Um, and she finally got tested yesterday and she's supposed to have the results back in two or three days. But so she's self-quarantining, but people want to be tested. They want to get the results. I think that I, I really believe that the Department of Corrections and the governor did not want testing in the prisons. I think they, I, I think the reason they didn't test was because they didn't want the results. Uh, and you know, there's no way to prove that, but I just, uh, other than the proof is in the eating of the pudding or whatever that. So similar to what the Trump administration was doing. Yeah, yeah, they that's didn't want, they totally, didn't want the bad news. yeah, yeah. They don't want the bad news, exactly, exactly, exactly don't want the bad news and they knew if they tested there would be bad news so it's uh we got a, a, a prisoner email it's called jpay i got a jpay this afternoon from a woman that we're working really closely with at purdy and working with several there and uh they've now got two cases down there and uh and they know exactly it, it, it came from receiving and now they've got people in isolation, and they're being isolated in this, the students of ours in the housing unit where she's at, the people are being isolated there. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so after a case is confirmed, then they test. And, and it seems to be limited, too. So it's just... Uh, and I, you know, I, I assume it'll explode. It, it, it'll be just like Con L and, and, and um, kind of like stomping your foot on the gas pedal of a Ferrari or a Porsche. You know, once you, you, you know you're at zero one minute, and the next minute you're at sixty or fifty-one or two hundred thirty-three people or whatever. It's just, it just happens very fast. You, you can, and none of us really know how to drive at those speeds. No, right, you know. right. The car's going to crash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The car's going to crash, and yeah. Inevitably, it's the yeah. uh, people outside of the car that end up getting yeah. killed. So, anyways, that's just, and I just seems to me, I've watched, I've got Inslee set up on my Facebook. You know, you can push some button, like, so. so every time he does a news conference, you get, a notification which is really good and then and and I watch him and he he seems to be so responsible I think he's handled if you divide Washington State into two groups prisoners and then everybody else which I, I think in his mind it's like the human beings and then you know us versus them thing prisoners aren't human they're unhuman I don't know why he thinks about it but he does, obviously doesn't give a damn about them and their families um and and again that's just evident and so uh because he's he's treating those eighteen thousand men and women differently than he's treating the public in yakima or the public in olympia 
for the public in Seattle. I mean, he's if he was wa if he was as conscientiously watching out for prisoners as he is for non-prisoners, the prisons would be safe. You know, it's a, it, it, and and uh, that's not happening. So, on a brighter note, you know, this was really cool. Uh, um, I got an email yesterday or the day before, I guess it was the day before, from Weir Harmon, who's the executive director of Town Hall Seattle. And uh, he asked me if I would interview David Sheff and then moderate a panel on, on David Sheff's new book, uh, which is entitled the, the, the Buddhist on Death Row. Uh, how one man found light in the darkest place, and um, for those who don't know, uh, David Sheff wrote *Beautiful Boy*, which is a story of his son's ten-year addiction with with uh, meth. That became a it was a 2009 book, incredible book, and but then it became a, mo a major motion picture in 2018, and it's still on Netflix and Amazon Prime, and s super well worth watching, but. So David wrote he, that book. He's uh, uh, number one. It was a New York Times number one bestseller, and now his new book, uh, *The Buddhist on Death Row*, is about a guy who's uh, is Jarvis Masters, and he's been on death row in San Quentin for thirty years, and he but he's become a leading international um, leader or expert on Buddhism from San Quentin while on death row. So. Next Wednesday, uh, I'm going to ask a Hannah to put this up on our Facebook page, and I'll put it on my page. But next, and Town Hall has it on their page already, and in their Twitter feed. But next Wednesday, I'll interview David Chef. August 12th. Yeah, August 12th, and I'll interview him for 30 minutes, so we'll have a conversation. And then they're going, and then Town Hall, unbelievably, wonderfully, is going to dial into San Quentin. And and get uh, get Jarvis Masters in in the conversation with us. So that's really pretty extraordinary. It's you know pretty extraordinary. I'm excited about it. And uh, we've got Chef's books on. Uh, we've got them on audio books. We've got it on our Kindles. We've got it in hardcover. We've got it in paperback. And it's it's really extraordinary. If you if you Google. David Sheff and it's uh, S H E F F. There's some great YouTube's like 30 minute interviews and stuff where he where he and his son were together on um, various you know big time you know CBS you know morning news type shows and 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 uh, and it's an extraordinary story. And so his his son is bipolar. Um, and uh, and just battled with meth for ten years, and, and and you know David's story with his son reminded me so much of Pete Early. I swear to God, because like my favorite line in Pete Early's book Crazy is is like the very end of the book, and he's talking about these truths that he learned in the process of standing by his son and getting his son to a safe place in life, and the third truth in in Pete Early's book Crazy is 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 is, is you never gave up. You don't give up, and and um, that that I almost can't read that without like getting tears in my eyes because it's it's in, in so many so many people over the last fifteen years with our nonprofit. It's been the same thing. You know, as funding allows, um, you know we don't we don't give up, um, and uh, unless you lie to us. Breach our honesty policy, and I will personally see you rot in hell. Uh, you know, because I, I, you, you don't lie to nonprofits. It ain't cool. You know, uh, but but uh, um, but anyway. It, so there's a listening to David and his son on one of the big time interviews that's on a YouTube, and he and and he's talking about. He never gave up. He stuck by his son for ten years, and now his son is spectacular. You know, he's got his—he's—he's he's doing extremely well, actually. And uh, 
uh, and has, you know, I don't think you, you don't cure addiction, it's always there. You can be, you can be clean and sober for 10 years and relapse the first day of the 11th year. So you have to manage that unendingly, but 10 years down the road, he's doing extremely well, extremely well. So anyway, on um, August 12th, next Wednesday, uh, we'll have, we'll, I'll be um, really honored, to tell you the truth, uh, to, uh, to interview David Sheff and, and, then, and then to get hooked into uh, Jar Jarvis Masters at San Quentin on death row uh, to talk about um, you know his 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 move into Buddhism and how how that's played out and hit you know David's new book um, some of the people that have praised it once the Dalai Lama and, and it's, it's like uh, uh, you know New York Times uh, Saint Helen you know Helen Prejean is knows uh, uh, knows Jarvis Masters personally, and, and, and so there's, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty extraordinary. I'm, I'm excited. What time does that start? I don't know. Let me okay. see. If, well, it's, it's probably like, either 7 or 7.30. It's, it's, their uh, start times. it's uh, 7.30. All right. Yeah. So everyone can watch that from the yeah. comfort of their electronic device. <laughs> you said your recliner with your... Google Pixel 4a cell phone in your lap or your Kindle or whatever. So it's, uh, but it's, it's really, I can't imagine. I did five years in prison. I can't imagine doing, you know, and in some pretty harsh prisons, but you could still go to the yard. Atlanta Penitentiary, you could go to the yard. Lewisburg, you could go to the yard. Uh, Allenwood, you could go to the yard. Ferriton, you could go to the yard. Death, pen Death Row, there's no going to the yard. And, and uh, I did about two and a half years in the hall. And even, and even in the hall, I could cause enough ruckus with grievances and lawsuits to, uh, to make them take me out of my cell to another cell, which was set up as a law library. And I could bang out grievances and lawsuits and then go back to my cell. But there's none of that at Death Row in San Quentin. And that's where... Uh, that's where Jarvis J. Masters has been for 30 years since 1990, and I just I can't imagine. I mean, really, and and, and then to just turn um, turn that into something that's amazing to the point that he's known worldwide for his study and work and practice with Buddhism is. It's extraordinary. So it's uh, I admire the guy, and it's going to be amazing to be have town all connect us to him. It's going to be kind of a wow moment, really. It's uh, um, yeah. So that's I'm I'm excited about that's that. That's exciting. Yeah. So um, so also this week, uh, your organization, the Post Prison Education Program, has uh, sent out a survey. Oh God, yeah! Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, so Hannah Myrick is in charge of. I mean, she's running this backstory series, which I think everybody knows about, and I love it. And it's been she's interviewed Anna Myrick Halsey and Jack Connolly uh, and some amazing people and and uh, students of ours, Jenny Burton, and she's interviewed. We we haven't posted the interview yet, but Jen Hammond and. Uh, she just interviewed this week Kevin Allen, but she's she's been doing amazing work with the backstory series, and she uh, and Caitlin Lombardi, who's our all not quite new but almost new director of development, um, have put together a survey that we're trying to reach out to to people that have known us for a while. So we put it on our listserv, it went out today, I think. And we put it on the Facebook page and I shared a link to my Facebook page. And we're just trying to get honest, candid feedback from everybody um, 
about wh what they feel, you know, what, what they care about, what their issues are. So in our office, we have um, our passions. And, and like Hannah's doing a profile right now. She's making all of us, uh, it's like fill in the blank, trying to do staff profiles, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so like what drives Caitlin, it would be maybe different than Taylor. And, and um, as passionate as I am, I'll never reach the level that Taylor Buck's at, but so, so and what drives her um, would be, is nuanced and different than me. So we're, so we're trying to find out through the survey what, and what supporters, what they care about. And, 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 then, and then Hannah and Caitlin will look at the feedback we get and, and we'll adjust. Um, and, and so we, we did, we did uh, that did go out and uh, I think they sent it out to the list, listserv in three parts. So it was like as of today at three o'clock, everybody on our listserv had gotten it. And, um, and then it's, again, it's on the Facebook page and on my Facebook, the settings are wide open. The, the privacy settings are wide open, and uh, so the link to the survey is there. And um, I hope people will take time to to uh, to complete it. And it's about, it takes about five minutes, and they're well thought out questions that that Hannah and and Caitlin came up with, and uh, and we're looking for feedback. Uh, so it's. Uh, you can, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure, but not totally sure, uh, what I, that Hannah will probably have that survey on our website. Uh, she'll, so she'll probably take the survey that went out to the list serve and it'll be on the blog section. But I'm, I'm not totally positive of that, but you can go to the Post Prison Education Program Facebook page, and that's the top post now, and the link is there, and then my Facebook page. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's just, um, you know, a, a software engineer at Google might be supporting the post prison education program for very different reasons than uh, a woman whose brother is locked up in prison. Uh, or uh, tomorrow I'm, meeting at 9.15 with a, a guy, uh, Anthony Powers, who at one point had a 72-year sentence and did many of those years, but he's out now and he's an activist and he's doing extremely well and he's up from Walla Walla. And, you know, what he cares about would be different than than other people. So we want to get everybody's perspective and, and, uh, and, and help us, uh, you know, do a better job and, and, and connect better with people that are supporting us, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, period. So it's the first time in 15 years we put out a survey and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it and, uh, and it's, it's important so how people will engage. So. It'd be interesting to see what uh, potential tweaks and or direction changes you might incorporate from the responses. Yeah, you know, there was a funny story. I don't know if I should tell this or not, but when, when we decided to hire a development director um, and we put it out on Idealist uh, and um, Caitlin applied and um, And I, I, I knew, and she had been with ACLU Washington for more than a decade. And I have some, I have, I have some, I know a lot of people at ACLU Washington. One person who um, was at ACLU Washington for a while is, I consider as a close personal friend, Elizabeth Smith, um, who's in New, New York now. And, um, uh, uh, and I called Elizabeth and, and 
was like, do you know Caitlin Lombardi? And, and she's like, oh, hell yes. And then she just went on this rant rave for like 10, 15 minutes. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I got it. So, so uh, we, we immediately, but anyway, the story that Elizabeth, Elizabeth told me about Caitlin was that um, th there was a legislative effort that ACLU Washington had um, and and somebody in the public reacted really badly to it, and um, and it was it was an effort that Elizabeth Smith was heading as she was the ACLU Washington legislative person f before she moved to New York, and 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 you know a lot of times you know if somebody reacts badly to something you say or do or write or publish or position you take, then you can react badly to it also. Or, you know, a lot of times with me, depending on how badly they react, I can be like, F you, and you'd be lucky if I don't send somebody to your house to see you, right? And and not really. I wouldn't, never would I do that anymore. 20 years ago, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but 30, 30 years ago. <laughs> anyway, um, but Elizabeth told me the story about Caitlin reached out to this guy uh, and 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 communicated with him and, and worked to win him over and to change his thinking. And that's what we really need. I mean, we we need that so badly. So any and, and and so uh, anyway, we're we've got some really amazing people working with the survey and and and. Uh, and we'll, you know, if, and, and we'll, you know, if people have ideas in their mind about who prisoners are, about maybe the work we do shouldn't even be being done or whatever, um, we've got people on our staff now that can do, that, that can communicate intelligently and, and, and maybe win people over, change opinions, you know, public education, it's... Um, Wouldn't you anticipate most of the people that are going to be taking the survey are already supportive of your work? Yeah, and, you know, if you're on our list, sir, or if you're one of the 24,000 people on our Facebook page, then you're supportive of our work. And, and then so there it's going to be more of a finesse. Who knows? I don't know what people are going to say. Uh, but we're looking forward to it. It's super important. We've never done it before. And, you know... Um, it's, it's the first time in 15 years. And speaking of which, when I said 15 years a minute ago, it reminded me I, we were we have a team meeting every Monday from 10 to 11. And some sometimes it'll be like maybe Taylor's in the office and Caitlin's at home and and I'm at home and uh, you know and, and Hannah's in the office or at home or whatever and and. For the last couple of months, Layla's been in New Delhi for crying out loud, and um, and then and so we were talking in the last team meeting that our 15th anniversary is August 23rd of this of this month, um, and which is kind of a big thing, and uh, at least with me it is. It's it's like. Um, so that's, uh, and Hannah just interviewed Kevin Allen, who was, you know, we've had on this show before, and is the guy who, me meeting Kevin is, is why the program started. I was across the street at UW, had finished four years and was applying to law school. And um, a graduate professor at the School of Social Work, which is what, one block south of where we're sitting, or two, uh, told me about a, a, a nonprofit event, and she said that was happening that Saturday, and she was like, "You should go." And um, and I went, and it was a welcome home party. It was at Pocan when Pocan was way down on South Rainier, in the, like the twenty three hundred block, and they had a fabulous building there and uh, and and so it was a welcome home party for um, 
I think three men and two women coming back to the community from prison. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't a big deal like, you know, turkeys and spaghetti or any of that. It was just, it was the people coming together to let these five men and women know that the community cared, or at least some people in the community cared. And, um, and uh, you know, dental floss and sweatpants and some towels and toothpaste and toothbrushes and but they were given us they were invited to talk and and you know i'm like i'm sort i'm sort of spiritual if i'm on the top of a mountain in yosemite but nine generally i'm about as spiritual as a rock right and and so all this stuff about where well, you can get an unlit candle from this table over here and light it and then put it on this table and then talk all that i was like not ha not into that right but kevin allen bravely courageously um took an unlit candle lit it and decided to talk and changed my life turned me upside down because he you know it takes a lot of courage to it shouldn't but in this stigmatized society, it takes a lot of courage to talk about being mentally ill. You can say, I've got syphilis, I've got gonorrhea, I've got cancer, I've got this, I've got leukemia, I've got whatever. And there's no stigma. Maybe, maybe with syphilis and gonorrhea there is, but, but not on the level of, of you know, I, I'm mentally ill. And, and so for somebody to get up and, and just back then, I don't think that it hadn't been changed from bipolar, manic depressive to bipolar, and and to just talk about suffering mental illness and being bi bipolar, manic depressive, and addicted to crack, and he talked eloquently about it, uh, and I was blown away. I mean, I just spent four years at UW. The, I'm, I had applied to law schools. I'd taken the LSAT. I'd actually been invited to fly to to one law school in Florida, one in Boston, and one in California for interviews. And so I was literally headed for law school, and I was going to spend the rest of my life suing prison systems. And my dream, literally, for real, my dream was to, like, if I lived to be 85, the day before I died, I would have filed one more lawsuit, right? One more Section 1983 lawsuit. And, um, and, uh, and I stopped all that. And I wrote to Mike McCann, who's still at UW. He's, he was uh, chair of political science for a while and then stepped down from that to found uh, Law Societies and Justice. And, and McCann, without knowing that I had been in prison for, the, for five years before I met him, had been sort of a mentor. I mean, I was like, I got out of prison when I was 52, and I um, was then and immediately went to UW. I mean, I came to Seattle just because I wanted to go to the University of Washington. I mean, that was from 1998, sitting in the hall at SCI Raybrook in Raybrook, New York. Um, I knew I was going to come to to Seattle to go to go to school here because I wanted to go to the to the law school here. And and had you been here before? I, I had been out here on business in the 80s, so um, in, in the 70s, actually. And, and so I had been at Hood River. I'd been on Mount Hood. My wife and I had camped on Rainier and fed peanuts to the chipmunks and, you know, taken the jet boat to Vancouver and all, done all that. So I, to me, it was like the most beautiful place on earth other than Switzerland or Yosemite. And, and, and at the time, the law school was in the either top 25 or top 40, so I thought I could go to the most beautiful place in the world and go to a top-ranked university. And um, so anyway, I, I um, just was on a, a track to go to law school and, and, and litigate for the rest of my life, and I met Kevin Allen. And I was, I was really, I was truly blown away. And I, I sent to everybody that I work with the email that I sent to Mike McCann after meeting Kevin, and and um, and I just asked McCann, I'm like, you know, would you support a pro? I, first of all, I tried to describe Kevin, which is very hard, and and then um, 
Uh, and then I uh, asked Mike, I, I said, would you support a program that helped people like this guy? I said, what I said was under the heading of saving lives, which really today really rings true with me still. So uh, under the heading of saving lives, you know, would you support of a, 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 pro, a program that helps people like Kevin um, get into college? And at the time, I think I was thinking just about UW. I was thinking about getting people into UW. I wasn't thinking about Walla Walla Community College or or Lower Columbia down in, 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 in you know, Kelso Longview or, or Pierce College in Fort Steelacum. I wasn't thinking of, or UW Bothell, or UW Tacoma, all the places where we've had students. It's crazy. Uh, I was probably, I think I was just thinking, but so I wrote Mike, and he's, even to this day, he's incredibly busy. I saw him a couple months ago when I, I took, before, I think it was before Jenny Burton started at UW. So she'd been accepted and she was going there, and I took her over on the LSJ hallway and introduced her to Jamie Meyerfeld. And then I looked in McCann's office and he was on a, a Zoom or, or Google Hangout or whatever with somebody in Egypt where a student of his had been locked up by the Egyptian government it was world news for a long time. And so I, uh, so I didn't, so then we went back to Jamie's office, and then M McCann came back over. And but he's incredibly busy, and I'm and he doesn't always respond to email really quickly. But that email, he responded almost instantly. And I think he was in Italy that that month. You know, doing doing some teaching in Italy um, over the summer break or something. And but he was like, yes, yes, yes. To every question I asked about responding, he was like, yes, yes, yes. And you know, then I went, uh, I, Robin Hennis, who's still in admissions at UW, um, and I regard her as one of the four co-founders of the Post-Prison Education Program, so I thought, well, that was a cool response from McCann. Let me see what, you know, I'll, I'll go talk to Robin. And so I sent the same email. Actually, I think I took a hard copy of the email went over to Smith's Hall, up to the third floor, and, and showed it to Robin, and it got the same resounding response, right? And then, um, in another matter, I had met Kim Ambrose, uh, who at the time was the supervising attorney of the Child Advocacy Clinic at the law school, and I, and I asked Kim if she would support a program and that would get people like Kevin into school. And, um, you know, I was really sad about a month ago to see that the UW club is being closed or has been closed. I thought that's, that's really sad to me. It's like, uh, but so in August of 2005, Kim Ambrose and Mike McCann and Robin Hennis and I met for lunch in what back then was the UW faculty club. And then, uh, and Kevin actually popped by and said hello and it was at, at, at that lunch where we decided to, to start the program. And so that was, that's uh, 15 years ago. Um, a lot of, a lot of heartbreak and a lot of positive things. I mean, there's people have died from suicide, people have graduated, people have had children. Um, it was pretty cool. Facebook you know, does a stupid thing. Where, it's not stupid, but they pop up these memories, right? And sometimes you, you think, it's like, I wish that never happened. <laughs> and, but recently, my Facebook has been popping up some of the coolest things. It's like popped up Jenny Burton's daughter, Gia, um, in our old office at the Central Building, and, and, and uh, a former board member, Allie McGregor, had brought in a box of this WSU cheese that's so damn good oh my god it's good and um and so like gia was i think three or four years old at the time and so that's so we pot, i put that you know i shared that and 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 so those and she's now 14. i called jenny i said i just put a picture of your daughter on on my facebook and um 
and I read what I posted, and I had said 13. Jenny, Jenny's like, no, she's 14. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? But she grew up in our office. She grew, Gia grew up in our office, right? And uh, so there's been some really wonderful things and a lot of friendships formed and a lot of arguments and a lot of hassles and a lot of tears. And, um, but it's, uh, so, so we're, we're, we're 15 years old on August 23rd. 23rd. Yeah. Which is, Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I don't even, but you know, back then, this is all like going through my mind. It's like somebody, some media person, um, even back then we used to get a good bit of media. And so somebody asked me, um, you know, like what my intent was or where I was going with this and, and at a time when I didn't even know. And, um, and, I, and I think we, I think my response was that I just want to see one person graduate, right? And then I'll be fine. And, and so I just want to see one former prisoner who's had a really bad life um, walk a graduation stage. And, and, and then I'm, I'll be fine, you know. And then I think I even said a, 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 in the email response to this person, it was like, then God can strike me dead and I won't give a damn. I'll be, you know, I'll be happy. And so, but what happened was seeing people, uh, um, seeing people escape adversity or however you want to call it, break away, beat it, batter it down, walk over it, uh, and and move into some level of happiness. If anybody on this earth is happy, I don't know, probably Donald Trump's, and he's probably maybe not even happy right now because he's getting ready to go to prison, but hopefully. But, um, but uh, you know, but to see people just overcome, you know, especially the people that have been locked up, you know, six, seven, eight times, um, put their life together, um, or locked up for too long in really adverse circumstances, uh, and then seeing that, seeing them graduate and do well, that's addictive. So I'm like officially an addict, right? And I and I've been this profile that Hannah was is making everybody that I work with write. Um, I, th I forget what the question was, but it was sort of like what you know, you know what what really is exciting to you and I'm like graduations two exclamation marks so so we just um, and I and just you know by by the way of sort of humanizing who prisoners are maybe in hopes that jackasses who work for the governor and the governor himself might start treating people in prison as people um, you know our first graduate was a woman Becky uh, Back then, her name was Hopwood when she applied in 2006, and now she's married and it's Heffling. Um, and, um, but she, and there's a, a River Sticks Foundation did this, Cody Swift did a, who was vice president of River Sticks, and, and it's his foundation, uh, did a really beautiful six or seven minute video uh, uh, with Becky and it's on our Facebook page and I think it's on our website but I'm not sure but um, you know she was um, a mom married and um, I'm glad I'm telling the story I, 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 um, um, and literally got kidnapped so she's in Walla Walla. Her, her dream from childhood was to be a nurse, and she was a nurse and at that point in her life. And she got kidnapped and uh, taken over to Tri-Cities and locked in a house and repeatedly raped until she escaped. And, you know, when I visualize this in my mind, um, I, I just, I, I can just, I, I, I just, in my mind, I can, you know, she's locked in a room in this house, and every couple hours, here's the footsteps coming down the hallway, and she knows what's getting ready to happen again, right? She's going to be raped again. And that happened 
throughout a weekend. And she finally broke out of a, out of the house and ran, I think, to a nearby 7-Eleven. And uh, so what the trauma from that, and not so much the physical trauma, but the metal, mental trauma, was so bad that she took a leave of absence from the hospital. And I've got to finish this in 10 minutes. So, and she... Uh, and she was home. And I got to tell you, uh, ju jumping forward, uh, once she came out of prison, um, uh, Gary Locke had finished his eight years as governor, right? And he went to Davis Wright Tremaine as a partner. And not, not at the level where, like, your rate's $1,000 an hour. When Gary went to DWT, it was like, for a, if a country would give him a quarter million dollars, he'd do something for him, right? And, but in that high stratosphere environment, Gary agreed to do pro bono for us work to get Becky passed a federal exclusion to get her license back so she could practice again. And, and the, the package that he and two other lawyers at Davis Wright Tremaine put together was really impressive, and I and I still I have it in a locked room in our office. And and uh, but anyway, so she she was home, and what made me think of Gary was was uh, uh, he, he he some of the lawyers two of the, two of, two of the, there was a three people on the team, and Gary was head of the the team, and David Tarshis, who's now at Northwest Justice Project, so he left sort of retired from DWT, and then there was a, a junior lawyer that was doing a lot of the, the legwork, and I think he went with, with uh, Group Health or Kaiser or something, but, but they interviewed Becky for four or five hours downtown Seattle, and, and out of that came a 13-page declaration, uh, which then got put into this large presentation to DSHS in Olympia asking the state officially to officially ask the feds to remove this exclusion right but so in that declaration that Gary and David Tarshis and this other lawyer wrote uh, they describe uh, what happened to Becky after the rape and and, and there's a scene you know, there's this wonderful word that nobody uses is lime l-i-m-n so it's like it's it's words that create a picture that's the way I think of that and so you're reading this declaration that Gary Locke and, and Tarshish wrote, and and and, um, and you uh, and there's this there's a scene in there where she's downstairs in her house, in a closet with the lights off, um, in a fetal position, just completely from trauma, dysfunctional, you know. She's not functioning as a wife. She's not functioning as a nurse. She's not functioning as a mother. She had three kids at that point. She's just completely dysfunctional as a result of, of the kidnap and the rape. And um, in, the, in that environment, some quote-unquote friend who she knew from the hospital, I think the woman worked at the hospital with Becky, brought her meth so she could be happy again. And so you take this person who never even had a parking ticket, who if she was in prison now, she, she would be, you know, Sonia Hallam and Catherine Leathers and David Postman, who I've grown to despise, and Inslee, they'd be fine to treat her as a non-human, despite the story I'm telling, because she's, having, she's a, a low-life scum of the earth prisoner, right? Not a human being, but she... Uh, uh, so she got addicted to, to meth out of out of the to escape the trauma of the rape and the kidnap, and and then uh, at a point using meth, she couldn't. Work, she went back to work, but she couldn't work effectively as a nurse because she was uh, using meth. So she lost her job, and then she didn't have the money to buy the drug that she had become addicted to. So she started manufacturing and dealing, and she caught a seven-year case. And by the way, if you think we don't live in a rape culture, the guy who raped her repeatedly got a two-year sentence. 
you know, was just, ex- that's no words. I have no, no words for that. So like, uh, but Becky got seven years. Um, and it was a dozen sentence, so she, she didn't do the whole seven years. And uh, so she came out and, um, and um, uh, she went to work uh, for a very small nonprofit in Walla Walla where a woman named Janet Naram was on our board of directors, our original board of directors. And Janet introduced Becky to me by phone or something and she applied electronically and we accepted her and uh and to get to get requalified as a nurse the department of health here was in washington olympia was like you'll you'll have to redo your whole, your your nursing co- your college the curriculum so we got her into WSU's nursing school, which isn't in Pullman, it's in Spokane, interestingly. And she excelled. And when she and she did the practicum at 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 Walla Walla at the General Hospital. And she excelled to the point that the woman who was in charge of the emergency uh, room operations, a woman she's retired now, Becky Versteeg, offered Becky a job. And uh, and then and so um, she was our first graduate, uh, and, um, and so, so that's on that's on our. Um, and, and today, I should I should add, it's like, it, despite all the work that Davis Wright Tremaine did and Gary Locke did and David Tarsus did, uh, some jerk. Uh, I'll just leave it a jerk at DSHS, who, who used to work for Locke. When Locke was governor, this assistant secretary of DSHS really worked for the governor, uh, but he's known as a jerk, and, and he acted as a jerk. So he refused, officially refused, to have DSHS to make a formal request to the feds to waive this exclusion that kept Becky from practicing as a nurse after she had gone through nursing school for the second time. And, and, and actually, we wrote the $100 check that got her her new license back, and there's this wonderful picture where she's standing in front of a mirror in her house with her, her name tag on a nursing uniform that she couldn't use because the, the goddamn feds had this deal. It's like you could murder somebody. I'm watching the clock really closely, but you could murder somebody and come out of prison and go be anything, you know, uh, you, including be a lawyer. But if you have a if you have a, med, a, a drug conviction, the feds have an exclusion on that. So, despite the fact that Reagan and Ollie North and all these people are the biggest drug dealers this country has ever seen or ever will see, if you're a, if you're a, a, an individual like Becky and you deal drugs and get caught and go to prison, you can't practice as a medical professional again. The feds won't let you. The state of Washington will. Uh, but the feds won't. And so, like this DSHS assistant secretary refused Gary Locke's request to uh, make an official request to the feds to remove this ex- exclusion. And, and, and so she w- it was 10 years before, she was able, before that exclusion came off. So she worked as a f- in physical therapy, and she did really productive stuff. Um, and and uh, but now she's at Sacred Heart Hospital in Spokane, work, working as a nurse. So that was uh, that was the first graduation, and and that's what I mean, it sort of turned me into an addict, you know. So there you go. I'm just going to use my last few minutes or last one minute here. Just please do join Town Hall Seattle next Wednesday, um, the twelfth. The 12th at 7:30 at night. That's. It's, I think it's really going to be extraordinary. It's a shame that the Great Hall can't be open for for David Chef to be there, and then maybe they could pull this amazing guy from who's in San Quentin for 30 years up on the big screen. And and but it's we're, it's going to be. It's, I think it's going to be extraordinary. So I hope you'll join Town Hall for that. And then please look for our survey and give Caitlin and Hannah the feedback. All right. All right. Well, looking forward to corralling you back in here this time next month. Yes, sir. (laughs) And just talking with Ari Cohn. 
uh, founder and president of the Post Prison Education Program. And you can find out more via their Facebook page at Post Prison Education Program and their website, postprisonedu.org.